What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Eastern Current. I uh, just started to record this podcast and realized I was accidentally live on YouTube. So if you were one of the lucky ones that got to hear about 30 seconds of me talking on YouTube, you're welcome. Uh, but we jumped back over here just to record it, and I'm going to put it up on YouTube after this. Um, but just go check out our Eastern Current Facebook page, a great place to connect with other listeners and hopefully build a community of anglers with like-minded uh, aspirations and goals. I don't know... Never said that before, but hey, why not? Um, also, leave us a uh, a review or rating on iTunes. It helps out a bunch. And just share this podcast with your friends. Share this YouTube channel with your friends if you do like what we're doing. Uh, putting in a lot of work on the back end just to bring y'all some good content and help y'all catch more fish. So today we're going to talk about uh, spring fishing. <coughs> excuse me, spring fishing preparation. Kind of some things that you can do to get ready for this transition time as the water warms up and the fish is pa- fish patterns change up. Um, I've been seeing um, quite a change in the the way these fish are acting uh, as far as redfish go, speckled trout go, starting to see more flounder inshore. Um, and so just we're going to kind of talk about what we like to do as spring kind of comes to play, um, some of the tackle that you can kind of stock up on and get ready um, if it's not, you know, top waters and whatnot, hard baits, kind of get them prepped out for the season. So I'm going to go ahead and bring on Cameron and Jeff. What's up, guys? How's it going? Oh, hey, how dude. you guys doing? Doing all right. Doing all right. I uh, glad I glad I caught that we were uh, live there at first. And ended up. <laughs> I hate ruining those people's night, but you know what can you do? I wasn't ready to be all invested in a live show. I don't think tonight. You got a lot of people really excited. Seven. I think there were seven people there that uh, that Six. were excited. Uh, well, cool. How how have y'all been enjoying this warmer weather? It's been nice. Yeah, it has been nice. It's definitely uh, much needed. We've been getting a ton of rain this this late winter, early spring, so it's it's finally some good weather in the horizon. So very exciting. Good for the fish. Good for the fish for sure. Have you kind of seen a, a change in, in the behavior of the fish even just the past couple days? Yeah, man, this fish definitely seem to be a little bit happier and getting up into that shallow water, especially as, as that kind of tide fills in over those muddier bottoms. So really just starting to get out on those flats and bake in the sun, but still stay schooled up, which is nice. But yeah, I mean, they're definitely starting to get more into their spring patterns. Um, yeah, you'll definitely start to see a change. I've been seeing it already. Like you spook a group of fish or you throw a bad cast in a group of fish. It, when it's real cold, they'll all turn like mullet, like the exact same direction, go to the right or the left and stay real tight. But now when you spook them, they're, they're starting to kind of go different directions and break up and then come back together. And that's usually for me one of the first signs, um, first signs that I see when, when those fish are starting to think about breaking up and maybe changing their patterns a little bit. Cameron, what about you? You've been out on the water, water at all lately? I don't know why. I'm, I feel so cheesy asking this question because I know exactly what you've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah I, I mean a decent amount um and yeah i think like you said you start to notice a lot of their patterns of maybe not staying so much in the exact same spot um at least redfish are concerned like not staying in the exact same spot that they may have been for the past couple months yeah and, and you might see really big schools maybe start to break up into a couple different schools generally still like hanging around the same area. Um, but the, I think my favorite part uh, and what I like most about spring is just as that water warms up, it just seems like um, some of those fish or schools that, that we've been fishing or um, tend to start kind of unlocking their jaw <laughs> and I'd start eating like a little bit better, even, even if they've been like pretty pressured sometimes it's just a, a, a few degrees or, I don't know, maybe five to 10 degrees variance in water temperature sometimes seems like really just turn them back on. So that's my favorite part about spring. That's very sure. true. This time you get year, those, oh, sorry, what were you saying, Jeff? You'll get those huge temperature variations this time of year. You know, you'll get, like, I, I've seen as much as, you know, just in one area to another, almost 15, 20 degrees in, in temperature change, just yeah. like out on a big you know mud flat as the tide's kind of coming in in the middle of the day you got a low tide it it'll really you know heat up that water and those fish tend to really you know like cameron was saying unlock their jaws and get fired up yeah definitely 
it's uh it's crazy like you were saying Cameron how you could go fish a school you know one day come back three days later say the day first day you fished them they're really hard to catch and it's like a switch was flipped and it's a whole different group of fish they're fired up they're eating top waters they're chasing down baits uh, you go from having to flaw floss them is what I call it when you're kind of just trying to slide it right <laughs> yeah. to their mouth <laughs> hook them yeah, on the front I, of the nose and say oh nice fish yeah yeah I mean like um I think for for jeff and i and i'm sure you as well like fly fishing in the winter um can be super awesome just because the water's really clear and there's big schools yeah but it can also at the same time be really frustrating because i think we talked about this before but like you have to cast like 10 feet like lead them by 10 feet yeah. and just let your fly sit there until they until they uh swim over it and then start moving it in the winter sometimes just to get them to eat the fly. And I feel like um, sometimes in the spring, like you can do what you nor typically want to do, which is like, you know, a foot or two in front of their face and they won't spook off of it. Yeah. If the water's a little bit warmer and they do, they're just seem to be a little <laughs> more aggressive. I agree. It seems like one, one thing that I really started thinking about, this was maybe two or three days ago, fishing some real spooky fish is how much they actually are aware of. Like the fly line in the air, the fly line even just sitting on the water sometimes. Fish will swim up to the fly line sitting on the water and and turn off of it. And you think, Mm -hmm. oh, they don't see the fly line. They don't see the cast. A lot of times I think they're seeing that, but but they're just – there's so much more on their mind other than survival that it just doesn't really reference for them. And they they kind of Mm -hmm. disregard it. But um, it just shows how – sensitive the fish are how smart they are how important and and productive those lateral lines are that they have that they can really pick up and feel and see a lot more than we than we think but yeah that's a good point i mean it's a lot of you know i used to think like oh man you know how are these fish like spooking off a fly line they 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 shouldn't even know that it's there really Mm -hmm. and um I didn't really realize like how uh, aware they are until probably this a couple of years ago um, when I was fishing a school and there was a, a group of cormorants swimming on top of them and they were not spooking whatsoever. But as soon as I casted a fly in there, they like freaked out. Yeah, that's crazy. And like, how do they, how, they're not spooked from a bird swimming on top of them, but they're afraid of a fly line going through the air before it even hits the water. So I, I, I definitely think that they are more aware than maybe we think they are. You know what that tells me is we need to capture a cormorant, pluck some feathers, and tie <laughs> some flies out of cormorant feathers. If they're that, if the cormorants are that sneaky, I mean, we need to, we need to harness that, that uh, ability. <laughs> it's just interesting that they can tell the difference between something that's threatening and something that's not. Yeah, for sure. Something that's, that's part of their little life zone and something that's not. <laughs> A hundred percent. Yeah. hundred yeah. uh, percent. The the past couple of days that y'all been fishing, how have y'all kind of seen a change in some of the fish that you've been targeting? Seeing seeing some more fish, you know, some yeah. more more fish, a variety of species as well, you know, with it just life is moving inshore. You got a lot of stuff that was kind of sitting near shore and slightly offshore is kind of everything's starting to move in a little bit as those temperatures draw in for sure so you're seeing you're seeing more fish as well as a, a more variety of fish like you said earlier there's you know flounder starting to show up a little bit more um i had a buddy who was diving the jetty said he saw some some stripers on the jetty really recently uh, yeah pretty recently that's awesome yeah so there's just more more fish around and you know, it's, it's definitely starting to heat up a little bit. Yeah. I've been starting to see more bait too, uh, in the waterway, like yeah. in the morning when it's calm, you'll see them flipping, you'll see birds, you'll see turns <laughs> diving in the waterway. So bait's definitely starting to make its way back up here. You know, I think a lot of what we see at first are some of those smaller glass minnows and bay anchovies just based off of, I haven't laid eyes on them, but based off of the way the birds are feeding on them, that's kind of the last bait that leaves us too in the fall with the albacore and, and kind of the first bait to show back up. Um, as you know, I don't really see m- much push of menhaden and mullet until much later. I mean, mullet is a good ways into the summer. Every year, it feels like a little bit later those things show up, but um, it's uh, it's definitely starting to come back to life a little bit. And I'm excited to kind of do some, hopefully, some bonita fishing. I've been red fishing so much that I was telling Hannah today, I was like, 
I love redfish, but I'm getting a little burnt out. I want to go do something a little bit different. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, do some near shore sheep's head fishing, man. Yeah, for awesome. sure. For sure. The, the, sheep's head fishing, and there should be maybe some – Maybe some Albies will show up this spring. That'd be pretty sweet. I was looking at some pictures from last year, and we were not far from now. We were starting to catch them pretty good in the spring. Uh, I remember yeah. last year was like the, some of the best spring Albie fishing I've ever had here. Um, and, and someone asked me the other day, "Is like what's the best time of year, or like when can are there times of year you can't catch Albies here?" And I mean, you know, it seems like if you get far enough off the beach, you can catch them here year round. I mean, no one's gonna run forty miles off the beach to go catch Albie mm-hmm. or in the winter time, but, but they're always around. I think we get a lot of fish that move north and south, but also a lot of fish that just kind of move in and out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, well, cool. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit. I thought, I thought something cool to kind of discuss tonight would be, um, some of the stuff, the tackle and baits that we like to use, kind of how we'll transition from what we're fishing right now, fly wise and tackle wise, and, and, and then kind of how it transitions into the spring and summertime fishing. But, for me, a lot of it becomes fishing a little more full size baits, bigger flies, changing colors up a little bit. Um, what are some of the things that y'all like to start to throw as the water warms up? Oh man, um, I like to throw if for like a spinning rod. Uh, at least in the spring, some some jerk shads for sure. Yeah. Um, it, and generally in the spring, I feel like I'm mostly fishing clearer water. So I'll use like the whites and a little bit, um, some of the greens. Yeah. Um, and paddle tails I think would do just as good. Um, but still, I feel like you still have to consider, you know, something that'll stay in front of their face for a little bit. Not so much as went as like dead of winter, but something that'll stay in their face a little bit. Um, and then as far as flies are concerned, um, I don't think my color has like changed too much from, uh, winter to spring, but it's tans and whites, uh, even some blacks, yeah. um, uh, maybe a little bit, a little bit fuller profile than, uh, in the winter, just because as we talked about before when those fish are really spooky in the winter sometimes something that's really light and a slim profile is like the ticket because they get they'll spook off like everything um so it's it's something like you know a shrimpy type of pattern uh with a little bit fuller body yeah i agree i would say i would i would agree with that too um you know throwing a lot of the same stuff as you throw in the winter um if you find some fish that are, are slightly more aggressive, maybe throw a little bit more of an aggressive bait just to kind of do something different. It's always fun to fish something a little bit that, you know, that swims a little higher in the water column or is a little bigger, just, you know, a little bit more fun to throw. Sometimes throw in some top waters, starting with that a little bit this time of year. So just still fishing a lot of that, that um, you know, less aggressive, low profile, low profile baits that are small and natural colors but starting to mix in a little bit more aggressive stuff in there as well. For sure. Here, here's kind of a good way to look at it. Um, how do y'all, when you roll up on a school, like say you know there's a school somewhere and you roll up on them, and before you <clears> even <throat> fish to them, you can almost kind of tell what you can get away with throwing. So mm-hmm. maybe share how that kind of plays out. Like you roll up on a school, you're going to like, oh, these fish are spooked. Like how can you tell – based off of how they're acting and what they're doing what what you, what you can throw cuz a lot of times you can always drop it all the way back down to like finesse and, and catch them mm-hmm. but but mm-hmm. how do i know like oh i definitely need to make my first couple casts in there with a the top water or something like that yeah um, so i mean Cameron, you want to go ahead and hit this one yeah i'll take a swing at it and then you can clean me up right. um <laughs> i think you know if you're if you're uh, smart about it and you know exactly where a school is and you pull into the creek or wherever you're fishing and you're like pulling up to them and you already see them pushing away from you, that's generally a sign that they're going to be spooky fish, I'd say. Um, and, you know, the more, if you throw one cast in there with like a gulp 
or something like that on a jig head and you know that you got in them and they're not eating, that's also a good sign that they're going to be spooky fish and you got to <laughs> do like a little more finesse. Um, or maybe even use cut shrimp <laughs> in, in times of dire need. Uh, but I think a good sign for like when they're fired up is if you're pulling up and you know where they're generally going to hang out. You don't see any wakes going away from you. If you're really lucky, you'll see them all floating, which is always a good sign. Uh, I feel like if you see them floating, you can throw anything to them if they're going to eat it for the most part. Um, but if you go in there and you see them attacking bait or they're like busting or you know just acting like they're feeding fish and they're not just sitting there dead still or pushing away from you, um, then I would go with like a, a bait more so that you'd want to fish just for fun or just a more aggressive bait. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I agree. I would say when also to add on to that, kind of like when you're when you're approaching a school and they're not aware of your presence at all, you kind of want to take their energy into consideration. So if you have a school of fish that's up on a flat that's just barely moving, kind of laid up and slowly doing some winks, you're definitely going to want to really sneak in there very gradually and throw something that's really light. That lands lightly and can just kind of slowly twitch through there. But if you got another school in a different scenario where you've got maybe a little bit more of a wide creek that's mixed into a flat, you you know, those fish are kind of pacing back and forth and swimming pretty fast, you may want to kind of, you know, match their pace a little bit, kind of get way out ahead of them and work baits a little faster, maybe work a little bit of a bigger bait if they're kind of, you know, feeding happy. Yeah. So I'm just curious, kinda, though. Um, Judd, because you, I think you've probably seen this more than uh, anyone is on a school that you that you pull up on and you pull in and they're just like floating, which is like not super common. I, in my experience, times that that's happened to me, generally the first cast you get in there, no matter what you cast, maybe not a top water, but it's generally going to get eaten because they're like, to me that seems like they're happier fish. But have you ever had an experience that's different than that? For sure. I mean, pre pressured fish will still float sometimes, especially on warming days, you know, because the, the surface water is warmer. So you might get fish that are floating. Like one of the big schools that we've been fishing lately, they were floating today nicely, but they weren't mm -hmm. eating great, which is rare. I mean, typically if you see them floating, they're going to eat good. But, but these fish, you know, if, if they're really pressured and they're floating, it's probably really based off of the warmer water on the surface but 90 percent of the time floating fish are more aggressive and I, I always or i've kind of come to learn that just because they're floating and aggressive at first doesn't mean you can't very quickly put them down you know and 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 alert them to your presence um today and, and the other thing too is like fired up fish a lot of times you see them from so much further away because they are elevated in the water column like I got on a group of fish today and I was 150 yards away from them, 200 yards away from them. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I could see them. Like I, I was, I like saw the color tilt to my head to the side. That's another great trick. If y'all are listening, I haven't done that. Like if you tilt your head left or right, when you're looking, uh, it changes the way that the sun reflects off of the slits. You have slits in your polarization, your sunglasses, like little, little cuts that you can't see. And, and altering the way it reflects off of that can oftentimes give you a little bit more of an advantage, a little more visibility. And so I was doing that. I kind of saw the color, tilted my head to the side. I was like, okay, that's definitely fish. And then boom, 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 like three flashes in a row. And then once I saw them, I mean, I could, I could just look straight forward and see the color. Um, and those fish are happy. And I immediately, from 150 yards away, I said, let's tie on a topwater plug. Those fish are happy. We need our first 10 casts in there to be a topwater plug. Got up there, first cast across them. They were swimming away from us. We threw the plug out in front of them, worked it back through, and like five fish turned around in the school <laughs> and were trying to eat it like going against the other fish. And so that's just, that was, I mean, I can't tell you how stoked I was on that because that's not been the case lately. Um, so really just trying to read those fish and figure out, you know, and the, and the more you do it, the more you're going to understand um, your, the choices you need to make. But but uh, but reading those fish is important, and no, and, and no matter how happy they are, or how fired they up, how far fired up they are, the stealthier you can be, the quieter you can be, um, the better off. I mean, you're going to catch more fish, and, and even if you, um, 
don't want to catch a bunch of fish, just keeping those fish unpressured, picking fish off the school, staying away from the school, landing them, releasing them, those fish are going to be happier for you for longer periods of time, whether it be that day or that week or that month. You know, keeping those fish happy is going to make your fishing better and easier. So that's kind I'd of- say just another, like, uh, point that might be super obvious um, – is generally I'd say us us three do this and I, I would I would think most people do this but whenever you, if you're fishing a school and you catch one at least uh, from my um, from my experience if I pull off if I'm not fishing by myself of course but if someone else is fishing and they hook one I'll start pulling away from the school slowly so that they because a lot of times, like, when you catch one, they might be swimming towards you. you. Get Someone hooks one. He starts fighting it. And if you pull away from the school, sometimes you can get a, out of there and out of their way without even spooking them. Yeah, and definitely. And really that fish, and you can go back in, and they're still not, like, on edge. Yeah. yeah. I think being a patient fisherman and, and sitting in an area where the fish – because a lot of times these schools of redfish in the spring, they'll kind of mill back and forth between, like, let's say a creek mouth and a creek mouth or a point in a creek mouth kind of a zone they want to work. And if you can figure out a spot to get in, stake your boat out, sit in one spot and let them kind of come through. And, and I'm always trying to set myself up in an area where I'm like, all right, they're not going to be right off my boat, but they're going to be kind of a stretch of a cast. And every couple passes, I'm going to get a really good shot at them. And that, that to me has been the best way to be able to fish a school for longer and catch more fish out of it. Cause, cause like we always say on here, it's like the more you bump those fish, the smarter they get, the, the less they're, they're likely to eat. And Jeff, I know you do a lot of that your, yourself too. Yeah, no, definitely. <coughs> using, Sorry, allergies. Using the the marsh to your advantage, and what I mean by that is, is kind of, if you can, if possible, leave a piece of marsh between you and the fish to kind of separate yourself from those fish. Right, you, they're not going to swim through the grass if it's low enough tide. So having that barrier between you and the fish can really help with, with kind of, you know, just being in a zone where the fish are going to be, but also separating yourself so you're not constantly bumping them and spooking them. Right. So if you can kind of find yourself in a position, like you're saying, where you know those fish are going to kind of swim past you and position your boat on that on that piece of marsh and kind of just anchor there, you know, you might not get as many shots as you would if you're pulling around constantly on top of them, but the shots that you will get will be better quality shots and you're, you're not going to have as much of an impact on those fish. For sure. For sure, it's uh, it's definitely a double-edged sword. It's like you want to get in there, you want to get close, you want to get some good right. shots, but it's like, oh, and I, I need I, to kind of hang back. I, and I know you and I, we get we get kind of like antsy, and we we want to you know make a move quickly, but a lot of times, man, it just really pays off to be patient. And, you know, where I've seen that play true often days is um, some of the slower days in Louisiana when I used to guide down there. Um, you know, those fish will float real good down there. And a lot of times they'll, they'll do – like we'll see schools float sometimes where they're just up on the surface. They're not going down. But a lot of times fish will kind of float up. Like those big bulls will float up and sink down. And, float, and they might be staying in the same area. They'll just kind of like float up, sink down, come up near the surface, drop down. And I'll kind of – you know, when I first started fishing down there, me and my buddy Alan Kane, who's another guy here. Y'all know Alan real well. Um, started kind of fishing down there at the same time. And – he had the whole mindset of like, all right, if he mudded some fish out or spooked some fish off a point or off a creek mouth, stake out, sit there for an hour. And, you know, I'd kind of work through an area, sit there for five minutes and be like, I'm over it. And some days it would it would pay off more for me to kind of keep moving through an area. But other days it, it paid off more for him to sit there and really wait for those fish to give him the shot instead of trying to force the shot. So that's just another piece of the puzzle that kind of comes into play of like, all right, what's the right decision? And there's, there might not be a right decision. They could both be right. Um, but, I mean, there was one time where I was pulling up and down this bank. We're fishing the same big island. And I was kind of pulling back and forth. And he was just staying staked out on this point. And I pulled 200 yards down, 200 yards back. Had, like, maybe one shot. Didn't catch a fish. And he caught three fish just staked out in one spot on the point for, <laughs> for the 45 <laughs> minutes that I was pulling around. And I was like, all right, it does make sense to really just sit there and let him give you the shot sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, and that's kind of the same. I remember you explaining, you're, we were talking yesterday, Jeff, and you were talking about how you kind of did that. You pulled up against the grass edge. They were getting up on a little edge flat, and you're throwing the fly in there to them when they, when they gave you the opportunity. 
And, and fishing by yourself, man, that's that that's kind of the best way to go this time of year. Yeah, it's hard. It's that's kind of the you know the the only way you can do it is when you're fishing by yourself. It's kind of just because you can't be on a trolling motor with with these fish this time of year. I mean, you can, but not really. You know, productive. So yeah. being staked out in a particular spot where you can get a lot of shots is is the way to go. Yeah, and the other the other thing would be polling and then trying to cast. But then you know the current and winds. You hook a fish, then you drift into the whole school and freak them out. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, I've done that before too. <laughs> yeah. One yeah. of these days, I'm gonna buy myself a dang power pole for my skiff. <laughs> yeah, they're nice. That is a game changer. Sure. Me and Cameron were running a double boat trip the other day, and I was watching him use his power pole and just. I was, you know, we were fishing near each other and I was staked out on the bank, dragging on the oysters and he was staked out in the middle of the flat, all pretty and uh, (laughs) catching fish. It was frustrating. Yeah, they're so nice. They are nice. Just another two grand. That's all you need. Throw it on the back of any boat. (laughs) Um, So we were talking a little bit about baits and we got off in a rabbit hole, which is completely fine. I love it. Um, But... And one bait that I started fishing a couple winters or springs ago, when the fish do start to elevate in the water column, there's a couple of deeper sloughs that we all fish, you know, where those fish will be, it'll be five, four or five feet deep, but those fish are not floating on the surface, but they're, you know, three, four feet off the bottom to where a top water is not quite productive, but a soft plastic's getting underneath them. Um, fishing some small switch baits like mirror lures and small jerk baits and whatnot. Um, and and that I think that's another part that comes into reading that school of fish. Like just because you see the fish, like doesn't doesn't mean that. I mean, if the fish are floating and you throw a jig in there and it gets down to the bottom and it's deep, they're not going to see it. You know, you're fishing underneath them, um, and oftentimes when they're on the bottom and you're throwing something up up off the bottom, they're not going to pick it up or they're not going to come up and eat it. So, uh, are there some baits that y'all like when you're trying to fish that midwater column for for redfish? Yeah, like the heavy deans and the mirror deans. I like those a lot. Yeah. Um, any of those like hard bait mirror, mirror lures are, are great. God, they'll um, they'll smoke a mirror lure to those schools. Will like that. Yeah. That bite is a lot of fun. Well, it is. It is. And I like fishing hard fishing baits. Shallow sure. water too. Yeah, definitely. Or really just like or that just MR seventeen and stuff is great for fishing like a foot or, or probably more like two feet of water. Um, but yeah, I think they're killer. Or just Great. using like uh, weightless jerk shads, yeah. weightless hooks with a jerk shad, like a That'll worm hook, higher. rigged weedless. Yeah, yep, something like that'll work great. That kind of reminds me too. What is y'all's best lure for combating the terrible snot grass that we have this time of year? <laughs> That's a damn good question. Well, I'll thank fly. you, Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, feel I think I feel about that one every day. <laughs> anything that's going to ride hook up is going to help yeah for sure right there's, yeah. there's the uh but it'll still even get caught around the dang like yeah. front of the, the I mean, soft plastic on the line it'll get caught yeah there's nothing there. you really can do it's only you know mediate it you can only it's your it's stuff it's so but. bad it's almost so bad in some places that like if you're taking someone and or fishing with a buddy and they're like blind casting with a jig head. You're like, just don't cast until we see them. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> you're literally going to be pulling pounds of that stuff off your jig head for the next, however long until we find them. What happens is you blind cast. Then you're like, Oh, I got them reel in real fast. They'll reel in real fast. And they're like, oh, I got grass all over my lure. And then they're picking the grass off their lure while the fish are floating past <laughs> the front cool. of the boat. <laughs> oh, it happened multiple times a day. And it's like, and even not even blind casting, just making a cast and the wind blows it off a little bit. That stuff's a pain in the butt. It really is. Yeah, and, and, you and can't so, use, uh, sorry, what were you saying? You can't like, you can't even use weedless hooks. Yeah, I mean, it's it'll just get caught on your line. It'll get caught on the front of the on your grub. knot I between mean, your braid and leader. <laughs> it gets caught on everything. It so does. I mean. I think, like you said, but I think a good way to combat it is a is a suspending lure. But um, it's just hard to know if that's something that they're going to eat or not. For sure. And we're, I mean, as this grass dies more and more too, it'll be mid water column. That's the sucky thing too. Is it? It'll be just kind of floating on the surface, down at the bottom. Like the more dead it is, it seems like the higher it floats in the water column, the grass. Um, yeah. Dude, this is the time of year too of like 
telling people to cast into the grass because you're like in an area looking for the school and there's like all these patches of dead grass that are starting to float off the bottom a little bit and it has the <laughs> shadow underneath it and you're like oh there's there's about 20 right there at one o'clock throw a cast in there and you're like twitching you're like oh you're gonna get eaten you're gonna get eaten and you get up there and it's just a bunch of grass and there's no fish anywhere to be seen that happened a couple of times today and the baits baits covered in grass and then they they swim by out to your left and you're like oh dang it done it again <laughs> i've done it again i have a i have a question yep for for you two if um you have the luxury of taking like let's say four rods this time of year um no to, let's say no fly rod no fly what rod. are the four sounds like my and kind you of had day. To put a diff, and you had to put a four different baits on each rod which which what would you put on them? jeff you, you, take, you go question. first uh four rods I'd probably do. <clears throat> I'd probably do. All right, I'll just spit them out. I'll do a DOA shrimp on one, eighth ounce jig head with like a uh, with the opening opening night um, trout tricks. Trout trick. So there's two. Um, I would probably do a, probably do something in, maybe like a, a, a sh one with like a shrimp, another shrimp soft plastic, or, you know what, I'd probably do a mirror lure and then a top water. Mm. 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 That's good. Mm. That's the good stuff, Jeff. Yeah. Mirror lure, a top water, a, <laughs> a, 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 a shrimp, and a trout trick. Now I'll be eating on that all day long. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for me, I would take a live mud minnow on one, there. cut shrimp on one, quartered blue crab on the other, and scallop <laughs> belly. You're going all kidding. live and dead bait. No, I like no, no, no. I would go the... I strike finesse eye Texas eye jig, which is their small little jig with a uh, slim swim by Z man. It's like a two inch paddle tail. Um, I would go a Ned head. I've got to, y'all got to get some of these baits that I'm about to sh share because they're, they're eating them so much better than any other soft plastic, the spooky fish, but they don't hold up well. So my second would be like really any weight, Ned head that you want based off of the depth that you're fishing and, and the action you want. I, I've been fishing a little bit heavier um, just because it, it still it sinks kind of quick. And if I'm fishing a Ned head, I want it on the bottom anyways. Um, you think those Ned heads make a difference? I think they do when those fish are, when you're looking at gray fish, when, you know, like just dark bodies on the bottom, those, those baits kind of standing up and shaking a little bit. I think they help, man. Um, I really do. What is it, just a lighter hook so it floats better? It's a it's mushroom just, shaped head. So it just, when it falls, it falls straight and the hook sticks straight up. So your bait's yeah. sitting like this, wiggling. Um, but it's a mega bass. Golly, I can't remember the name of it. It's a little two inch paddle tail. It's about the same size as the Slim Swim. Can't remember the color. Can't remember the uh, the name. So it really does no good for anybody. <laughs> But it's it's a shake it's it's a drop shot soft plastic. So drop shotting is something I really want to try too in the grass. I think this would be really beneficial in the grass actually. I've never done it. But a drop shot is something that bass fishermen use, a lot of smallmouth fishermen use this. But you've got this little cylinder weight that's maybe like an inch long, and then your line coming off that, and then you've got a hook tied like a foot maybe anywhere from a foot to two feet above that weight right into the line that sticks straight out and you just nose hook the soft plastic. Um, and so you can cast it out there and just sit it there and shake it. Or with the redfish, you could throw it out there and still work it and just kind of drag it along the bottom. But your weight's down in the grass and your bait would be up off the bottom, you know, a foot or however far you set it. I think that would actually work really freaking well for, for the redfish in the grass um, and the snot grass. And, and, and even if there wasn't grass around, just keeping that bait a little elevated off the bottom but still being able to keep your weight there. Like, you know, all right, if my weight's tapping bottom, my bait's a foot above it. Um, but it's a that's what that, that little mega bass bait's made for. Um, I'll, I'll drop that in the description and the show notes, the link to that bait, because it has been really, I mean, fishing it next to that slim swim, getting, you know, five bites to one on that, that yeah. color and that shape. So 
Um, so the Slim Swim on a Finesse Eye, the Mega Bass um, Drop Shot Bait on a Ned Head, and then I would probably have a Top Water and a probably like a Diesel Minnow rigged on a uh, on a Texas Eye, like a full size Texas Eye jig would be my my go to, or a Mirror Lure. I really like throwing Mirror Lures, but I, I throw those way less. It probably if I had to pick four, it wouldn't be one of the ones that was tied on. Um, mm -hmm. that's more, yeah, I, I barely ever have clients throwing that. It's more so myself if I'm out there and the fish are juicing. Cameron, yeah. how about you? Um, I think top water for sure, just in case they're fired up. I think a Ned rig as well. Um, just in case they're on the bottom and they're being picky. I think I'd... <laughs> I feel like I'm the only person that ever says I use gulp, but I would definitely have a jig head with <laughs> some gulp on it just because sometimes, man, if they're really picky and you just don't know this time of year if they're going to be picky or fired up. Like, you just don't know. Yeah. yeah. Um, no doubt. It's so will, weird that they – I mean, it's got it's all the scent because those baits are like it's little all the scent. Oh, poop they're the sticks. Worst, they're the worst-looking <laughs> baits you could possibly imagine, and they will just – you don't even have to move it. That's why I do it a lot of times when it's like really, really spooky fish. You just throw it out in front of them where they're swimming, and you don't even move it, and they'll just pick it up off the bottom. And it, I mean, it's definitely scent. Yeah. Ugly baits and flies catch more fish. <laughs> What'd you say? Ugly baits and ugly flies catch more well, fish. Well, Cameron's screwed. Those flies you've been posting on Instagram are way too pretty then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> your old flies are going to catch way more fish. Yeah, yeah you're getting too good, dude. You need to backpedal. <laughs> uh, I should start using my dog's hair. More. Yeah, dude. Look at this. This is great. This is Graham's tail hair. We had to put him down a few months ago, and I cut some of his tail hair off while we were in the in the vet to tie some flies out of him. There's a famous fly called a deceiver, and so when I the first Graham uh, fly that I tied, I called it the golden deceiver because he was a golden retriever. <laughs> Fish of a lifetime on this. I will, and I have, and I will again. <laughs> <laughs> what was that, three? I said topwater, Ned rig, a gulp on j -Kit. What Ned and bait did you dis did you say which Ned bait you like? Do you you like the no. traditional TRD, don't you, the turd? I like, yeah, the traditional. I haven't used to these baits, except and for the one day that I used them with you guys. I know, and you're freaking blowing it, dude. I know. I think I might be because I, I haven't seen any of these fish get fired up on my bait. So yeah. Well, you live good. and you learn, Jeff. You live and you learn, dude. Yeah. Give me some. I can't give you any, man. I don't have that many, <laughs> but I'll give you some. I'll give you some. <laughs> Tackle warehouse, man. I've been buying. Up, I I get everything that I can from Intercoastal Angler. Shout out to my boys Ben and Ryan. I'm just kidding. I'm in, I'm in a weird. I'm in a weird form tonight. Um, but uh, Intracoastal Angler if I can and then Tackle Warehouse man they, Tackle Warehouse is like definitely a bass centered deal but they have every single bait known to man and it's categorized so well you can click through the tabs and it's like it, it tells you everything so um, tons of different crazy top waters and jerk baits and twitch baits and um Tons of soft plastics, creature baits. Like that's another thing that I'm going to start fishing a lot more of this year. I have the past few, but even into the spring is a creature bait. Just something that's got a little bit more movement with less action with the rod tip. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's another good one. Um, but yeah, sweet. So we've talked too much about topwater tonight, and that's something I'm real fired up to be able to do. I know y'all do a lot of topwater fishing together in the summer. Um, what are some of the baits, topwater baits you like to throw? And does size and color kind of play more of a... Uh, roll this time of year maybe than the summer? I think so. Um, I think sometimes this time of year um, when like like we were talking about the fish can either be really fired up or, or spooky um, sometimes it pays off to have a little bit more of a smaller top water. Yeah. Maybe something that's a little bit less aggressive. Um, whereas in the summer, I feel like I'd throw like a pretty, like an AJ popper, oh. like a what? AJ popper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One of those big Halico, like 
12 inch poppers. <laughs> it generally does really well this time of year. Um, but no, I, I'd say something a little bit smaller. I mean, and that's not to say that if if they are eating top water, they might eat any top water. Yeah. Maybe not a halica popper, but maybe a you know a she dog or a top dog or something like Definitely. that. But I would say just for um, probability and the higher percentage of getting bitten, I would say smaller top waters is probably what I would go to yeah. this time. Yeah, little spook junior. So that's what we had him eat today. Was that spook junior? In like a natural mullet color, like a whiter belly, black, silver on the sides. Um, what about you? Or color. Did you say anything about color? Uh, for this time of year? Yeah, for this time of year. And I moving into the that, spring. Yeah, I'd say probably more subtle colors. Yeah, more like, like you said, like white and blacks and tans. Um, I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever really tried like really bright colors on top waters this time of year so i can't say for certain if they would work or not but i feel like um that more natural colors just probably work better this when the water is really clear for sure um i think angle is so important too with the top water this time of year like yeah. when you do see the school of fish and, and waiting until they're giving you a good angle to throw the cast to them as opposed to bringing it across. Now, sometimes like today, you know, we bombed, bombed a cast across them because it was our first shot and it, it paid off. But as we fished those fish a little bit longer, angle became, became very important. You know, the fish would kind of turn on it and swipe at it, but not really fully commit to it. Um, mm-hmm. But man, it is cool. It is so fun to watch because a lot of times in those schools of fish, especially on a spinning rod, you don't really see the bites. With a fly rod, you do because it's a little more elevated in the water column. But with a top water to watch like five or six fish turn and chase it down on the surface in crystal yeah. clear water is pretty hard to beat. Uh, yeah. What about you, Jeff? Oh, uh, top top waters. Yep. Um, I mean, I think usually this time of year, if I'm throwing a top water, they're pretty fired up and they're not super picky, keen in on particular colors or size. But I'll usually throw like maybe pinks or yellows in the super clear water, and. Yeah, like Cameron said, smaller size, something that's not going to be super aggressive in their face. It can land kind of a little bit lighter. Definitely. Than big schools, but usually, most of the time, not really throwing top water yet right. as much right. as I will summertime. But, yeah, you know, something a little smaller, lighter colors. Yeah, right now, it's it, it's not necessarily going to be your most productive outlet, right. but it is fun to catch them on something different. And then, yeah. and then as it warms up, too... Right. It, it's like sometimes it's like they see something very different and they get oh, yeah. real fired up on it uh, oh, yeah. as opposed to like a jk like it can be more productive and i'd rather have five or six blow ups and catch a fish on top water than catch 10 fish on a jig i mean personally if i'm sight fishing them yeah it's kind um, of funny yeah. how it transitions though like i'm not going to pick a top water up in the summer to sight fish even though it's like more of a you know and it, another crazy thing too is like Throwing a top water at a school of redfish in the summertime in the middle of the day, they ain't gonna touch it. But like today, it was eleven o'clock and they were just smoking a top water plug right. in the bright sun, crystal clear water. Yeah. It's like what? It, I wonder what the different like why? What, tell me why, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I think it just has to do with their their optimal feeding times, right? Right now, their the primary focus is warmth. Right, and once they get that warmth, then they kind of switch over to mm. feeding. So that typically is in the middle of the day. So their aggressive feeding times, a lot of times this time of year, is is those middle of the days when the sun's high and the water's warm. Yeah. As opposed to the summer, it's the exact opposite. So they're looking for cooler water, and that's once they get their cooler water and they got that figured out, and then food's on their mind. So they're feeding in in the evenings and mornings. Wow, mm. I wasn't even really expecting to answer it. You just blew it out of the water. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. And that's exactly right, folks. You can take that to the bank. <laughs> that's exactly right. Um, anything yeah, else from I, I think, what were you saying? I think, uh, before you move on, the other thing about top water that maybe um, will be beneficial for people to know about, and I'll call myself out, out on this, is um, last Strong year man. it was summer and we were um, fishing in the river. It was summer last year, wasn't it? It was summer last year. I think we did have a summer last year. We did, we did. 
uh, <laughs> and we were fishing in the river, and there was fish like blown up on the edges of a creek, and this was a a big creek. Yeah. And uh, but it was dead low tide, so it's super shallow, and um, I had this guy throwing topwaters the whole time. And I remember calling uh, Judd after that trip and um, being like, man, I, d- I just don't understand. Like, these fish are blown up all over the place on shrimp and on mullet, and they just would not eat my top, the, the top water. And you had something interesting to say, and it was about water depth. Do you remember this? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, like, the, the lesson I learned is it, it can definitely be too shallow for water for a top water so like if you're if you're throwing a top water in like i don't know 10 inches of water sometimes that might be too shallow there's for them to like attack it yeah it's like there it could happen but the shallower it is they kind of like to get up underneath a plug to eat it a little bit um, mm-hmm. and so when it's shallow they really can't do that they've got to just generate a ton of speed from behind and eat it which will happen sometimes but more times than not, you want that two, three feet of water, um, or, or at least a foot and a half, two feet of water for those fish to get under and eat it. So you think about how a lot of fish like to feed, like even a tarpon, they're going to, the, the, the fly might be, you know, right over their head, but a lot of times they'll drop down and come up and eat it, kind of get that, that, you know, aggressive breaching angle to come up and get a good swipe at what they're targeting. So the other fun thing about a redfish is like the where their eyes are located out on the sides of their head a little bit. And when they finally like come out of the water to eat something, they really can't see it at all. And so it's usually so aggressive and they just kind of plow a bunch of water. And that's why you miss so many of them. But man, when it's clear water and they chase your, it's the same thing with a fly when you can really see your fly. Like today when the guy was working it, the fish would like be rushing up on it and they'd, the fish would be like three feet away. And it's so hard. I would have been doing the same thing. But like already kind of pulling the rod back, like because you want to set the hook, but the fish hasn't even opened his mouth yet on the plug. Um, um, you just I, you got to drill home, like keep working the plug as if nothing happened until you feel the pressure of the fish, and that's what I always always kind of try to tell people because whether you know you see the whole bite or you just hear it or feel it, I mean a lot of times throw a topwater plug and close your eyes is you know would be the best way to hook those fish, but then you miss the whole point of throwing a topwater plug really. Yeah. Um, is there anything else spring fishing wise that you think that it is important to touch on? Um, one of the big, actually, one of the big things for me is like this time of year, I'm always I pull everything out of my boat, everything out of all my tackle bags, get rid of all the crap and trash that's piled up, get rid of all the baggies that don't have any soft plastics in them, change hooks <laughs> out, kind of prep out for the season, and it'll you know everything stays organized for about five days, and then it's back to a mess again. Um, but do y'all have any kind of like tackle organization tips, any things that work for y'all on your boat as far as bags or, you know, plastic containers or anything that y'all do to kind of organize and, and make your time on the water a little, a little bit better. I think having an organized boat is important. Like if I know exactly where to go get the soft plastic I wanted to put on, you know, it's more time casting, more time on the fish. I'm, uh, I'm fairly OCD about, like tackle and what I bring. So I pretty much take everything off my boat every time. And depending on like what I'm targeting or what I'm doing that day, um, will determine like what I bring. Um, and I've, I've gotten to the point where I've just organized, uh, a lot of my tackle for like just a certain species. Yeah. And so some of that will incorporate like, you know, some stuff that I've, I'm, might use in the winter um but maybe it works in the summer too so i i feel like i've got a um a more just like general uh box for just species other than season gotcha 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 i like that so will you have like some do you keep your soft plastics in a hard case or do you keep them in like a salt in, in the bags they come in are you putting like top waters and jig heads and stuff in the same tackle box no so actually um so I have uh, a handful of like just hard plastic containers that I keep hard plastics in. Like Plano and boxes kind of thing? Plano boxes, yeah, which are freaking fantastic. They are. Uh, I got them like a year ago and they're unreal. Um, 
but now I keep all my soft plastics in like a Plano, almost it's like kind of like a binder. Yeah. Like a book, and it's like this thick, and it has like a bunch of plastic sleeves in it, um, which it just has you know as many soft plastics as you probably need for for every season. So I just I put that in my boat every time, and then I take one or two of the Plano boxes depending on what I'm fishing for, and then. Um, if I'm fly fishing or not, that'll determine which fly box I grab. Yeah, definitely. I just picked up, I've always run like a plastic Tupperware from like, I always, I live, there's a big lots near me. So I always just go buy the stuff there each year. I kind of just throw the old boxes away and get new ones, but like a big plastic Tupperware and like a shoe box size. And I'd fill that all up with my Z-Mans and my soft plastics. But man, it would get so much junk in there, like other crap that falls down in there. And so I, I got three of the or four of the Plano binders, the smaller ones. They got about 10 sheets in each one. Um, and I've organized it out to like Ned baits in one, creature baits in one, trout tricks, paddle tails, and, and swim mm-hmm. baits in one. Um, and then on the handle, there's like a little handle. I've written Ned baits or Ned rig baits and then mm-hmm. swim baits. And so I can open my hatch. I just did this two nights ago. And then I've got all those set in a plastic tubware thing in my hatch. So I can lift that up, see which one it is, grab it, pull it out, grab the bait I need out of it, slide it back in there. Um, the first day I didn't write the names of the things on top. And I, every time it was the last bag I grabbed that had what I needed in there. So I was like, all right, I got to write something on the top. But man, I've never run them in those little bags like you're talking about. And the yeah. little, it is the best way to do it, I think. It, it, at least for me, someone who's not naturally organized or like typically very yeah. organized whatsoever. Um, Jeff, it would work great for you too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting here listening to you guys saying, "Damn, I need to step up my game. My organization is is lacking." My, dude, I gotta try so hard to be organized. Dude, it's so much like I mean, I look at this know. room right here. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate. Very it's hard. Good. I think it looks good. I can definitely relate. I think it. I think just to your point. Um, organization for some people, um, me included, is can be um, a big factor in being successful or not. Yeah. If I'm not organized for for myself, like I just get, I'll get flustered and like forget stuff at home, and I'll have soft plastics melting into each other. So it it just helps me a lot personally to to be organized not that that it would be the same for everyone but definitely helps me out i'm i'm so unorganized at times and if y'all don't judge me i'll confess this here to everyone listening but i have been on guided i've been guiding before and been like holy crap i don't have any leader and like (laughs) distracted my clients and reached down to my fly rod and like trimmed the whole leader off of a fly rod and cut it up and tied it on the spinning rods as leader before it doesn't have, it's happened more than once, but it has not happened three times. So I'll let your imagination wander, but, but I mean, and then my whole day's ruined. I'm like, all right, this person's paying me. I'm because of my organization, you know, their day could be absolutely ruined. Not absolutely run, but because of my own organization or bad organization, you know, it, it can play a factor into how the day goes. I drove all the way to, this has nothing to do with organization. This just has to do with me being <laughs> ADD. I think I called both of y'all that day. I know, Jeff, it was the day you were flying out to Utah, but it was, I wasn't guiding that day and it was warm, but it was blowing really hard. And I drove all the way from my house to the put in <laughs> in downtown Wilmington to go striper fishing started backing my boat down and was like, I don't have any fishing rods. And so I pulled back up and strapped it down and just went home and didn't even fish. So organization and kind of knowing where your stuff is. And it's hard for me because I go between two different boats and it's like, I would love to just put all the tackle I need on both boats, but that's a lot of tackle and a lot of money um, and, and a lot of freaking tackle boxes. So um, Jeff, what works for you? <laughs> oh man, I've got... I, I usually have I have like a, a shelf with a bunch of small boxes, like the nine by twelve, I think. Uh-huh. Boxes, uh, little you know, tackle boxes or whatever. Like a have. shelf at your house. 
What's that? You said you have a shelf. You mean like a shelf at your house? Yeah. Kind of thing? So I, yeah. So I have a shelf at my house, which I keep like all of my tackle inside these boxes on those, and I'll just grab what whatever of those boxes I need for the day and throw them in my tackle box and kind of you know head out. And then usually I'll just kind of swap in and out depending upon what I'm what I'm going for, whether it's you know bait fishing or if I'm going to throw top waters or you know mostly throwing. Soft baits, kind of just depending, but I've got them all kind of separated. So in one box, I'll have a bunch of soft plastics. One of them, I'll have all my, you know, mirror lures. Another one, all top waters. Kind of just the basics. Have yeah. a, another that Grove box. I think it's Grove. Yeah, I got one of those, man. They're they're awesome. Oh man, they're so nice. I will say, get a little wire brush for those magnets, though. The little magnets get kind of rusted. I don't know if you noticed that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. But, the little magnet that closed the lid. Yeah, they will. Those those hooks. I've, I don't think I've had a single hook fall out of those things. No, nah, they hold nah. them really well. Uh, yeah, I've been super. Now you got them. like some football jigs for sheep's head that are in there, and they still hold those. They and hold those got, up. Yeah, thank you. That thing's awesome. It, it is keeps sweet. you know keeps them all separated. So you know you got a bunch of jig heads in one little slot. A lot of times, if there's salt water on them, they all just dude share the rust. Yeah, it's like I need, I need to find some sort of alternative for my top. I have just a box full of top waters because I'm a, addicted to buying them, um, man. And if you use one and you put it in the box next to like five other top waters, they're all gonna rust. They all rust. I have a solution for you. You only take four top water plugs out at a time. I can't. I can't, man. I need options. I take like twenty every time I go. To yeah, if you're only gonna throw one, <laughs> maybe two. You might switch out a color. You might switch out a size. I'll give you four max, but there's no way you're throwing four different top. More than four. No, there's something that makes you feel good though when you pull your tackle box out of the hatch and you sit back and you open it up and you have like fifteen top waters in there. And you're like, hey, yeah, I like, I like my options. Should I fish? <laughs> So like, it doesn't yeah. really matter. It just needs to move over top of their head, and they're gonna smoke it. But I do, I do need to find some sort of alternative to that, to that because I'm getting real sick of changing out all those hooks. You every need year. to get the Plano Edge hard bait box for them. Yeah. If you see what I'm talking about, it looks like the yellow I, Astro I, Turf. Yes, yes, yes. I have heard of those, and What's it would called? be super helpful. So Plano's whole new tackle box line is called Edge, and they've got these. I don't know if it's called a dehumidifier in them already. So. And another good hack before I forget about this is you can go on Amazon and buy a big box, like a thousand of those little beads that come in the little bags that you'll get. Yeah. Yeah. And and put a couple of those in each tackle box and they suck moisture out of the air. And so if you put something in there that's a little wet, it'll suck the moisture out. Unfortunately, it doesn't take the salt out and the salt will still rust, but it does help prevent the rust and slow it down. Um, That's actually kind of built into all the new Plano Edge boxes. Um, But they also have a hard bait box which it's in the garage. I should have brought, I don't know we'd be talking about this. Um, but essentially it's about a three inch in depth hard bait box. Then it's got all these little yellow spikes that stick straight up. So you can take your hard baits and slide them down in there and it just holds them. There's one like every centimeter apart in the whole box, like a big piece of AstroTurf and you just slide all your baits in there. And when you shut the lid, you push them down there and it just holds them in there and their ho- the hooks hang down. They're never tangled. You go to pick it up and pull it right out. It doesn't tangle with any other hooks. You use it for jerk baits, mirror lures, all kinds of things. You said you had a top water buying addiction. I've had a jerk bait buying. I bought six j- different jerk baits. Every one of them was over twenty five dollars the other day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna take them up the New River and lose every single one of them on the first cast each. But yeah. they trout eat expensive jerk baits better than they eat cheap jerk baits. <laughs> they do. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely do. I'll tell you what does eat them better is is uh, underwater stumps. Yeah, yeah, those are really good at eating bits. When are, speaking of Weldon, when are you heading up there? Weldon will be. I think I'm driving up on the the 25th of April. I'm doing a week, doing like five day stretch, coming home for my 30th birthday and hanging out with Hannah and Fletcher for three days and then going back up and another five day stretch. I'm just doing 10 days up there, but, uh, you know, a trip in the morning, trip in the afternoon, each one of those days. But, uh, y'all have to come up there again this year, do a little fishing, a little striper fishing. Um, but yeah, check out those Plano edge boxes. I can't, is there anything else organization wise that's good to talk on? 
I don't think so. I don't think so either. I think if you listen to this podcast, you can now be the most organized angler <laughs> in your angling friend group. Um, well, sweet. Y'all got anything else y'all want to share before we shut her down? We're right at an hour. It's beautiful. Spread the love amongst the fish. Don't pound one group. I know. I felt like I did pretty good at that today. Nice. I did pretty good at that today. Um, yeah. Spread the love. Spread the love. Spread the love. Um, and yet, oh, another thing, if you're listening to this, um, I'm going to try to get this up tonight, which is the March 10th. So by the night of, or by the 15th, you have the ability to submit a public comment about um, what's going on with uh, the vote that the Marine Fisheries Commission Board is voting on. Cameron, do you want to share a little bit about kind of what's going on real quick with that so people can kind of have an idea? All you got to do is go to CCA underscore NC, or like CCA North Carolina's Instagram page, click on the link in their bio. And the very top thing, it's a link tree account, so there's a couple different links, but it'll say public comment or flounder comment, flounder public comment or something like that. Click on that, you gotta put your name in there and you can do a little comment on there. It's super easy, it took me five minutes to do. Um, and just raising that awareness and, and showing people that, showing you know the state that there's a lot of recreational anglers out here that are upset with how the fishery's being managed um, will help out. But Cameron, you kind of want to talk a little bit on that, that issue. Yeah. Well, let me preface this by, uh, I only read through it once and, um, that was a couple of days ago. So I could be off on some of my facts. So it, if, if anyone's going to submit a public comment, I highly recommend that you read through it first and just make sure that you understand and you know, what, you, uh, what you're going to be commenting on. But I think the premise of it was, that they were up for vote on the 15th was to shorten the season for recreational anglers on flounder or shorten the limit uh, of flounder that you can keep. I can't remember which one it was, but, and then for, for commercial fishermen, essentially keeping it the same um, as it is now. So that was what was up for comment, I believe, or up for decision. Um, does that sound right? Judge yep. from what yep. you understand. Yeah, that sounds um, right. You know, and so it, yeah, it's frustrating. I think, yeah, it is frustrating, and um, so it, it, if that is something that you care about and um, something that you're passionate about, I, I highly recommend that you submit your comment. I think um, last time, what was it, a month ago or two months ago when yep. they had a comment period. Uh, someone told us that they had received like the most comments that they had received in a super long time. Yeah, uh, I think ever. Which is, yeah, it, well, yeah, maybe. And ninety percent uh, of them were recreational anglers, so that's awesome. Yeah, so I think that's, in my opinion, a step in the right direction as far as uh, improving our fishery for for everyone. Um, but you know, obviously, at the end of the day, it's up to to you and what you think and hopefully uh hopefully um just submit a comment whether it's in favor or not in favor um getting your opinion out there and having your thoughts on the fishery is always beneficial no matter what for sure i agree 100 percent. but again just real quick if you are listening the way you can get very easily and quickly to that public comment is by going to cca north carolina um, their Instagram page, clicking on the link in their bio. It's a link tree account, which is just a way that people can put a couple links all through one URL on an Instagram page. Um, so click on that. The very top one is going to say like flounder public comment or public flounder comment or something like that. Click on that and then it's just boom right there. Put your name in and your comment, submit and you're done. Um, super easy. If you do want your voice to be heard, speak up. That's all I can say. Uh, but guys, thanks so much for hopping on here. We're going to do some more podcasts, us three together. It's fun to chit chat with y'all. Uh, I thank your wives if they can hear me. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, we'll, we'll see y'all next week. Later, people.